why do we spend so much time talking about gospel communities right now? I mean, that was a super long announcement. Well, I hope, that, I hope this fact wasn't lost on you. We spend so much time on it because we put all of our eggs in that basket. Uh, at River Church, we really want 2022 to be a new opportunity for you if you've lost connection, which many people have uh, in the last couple of years. We want 2022 to be an opportunity for you to, to gain new connections, to reconnect. And so that's why we take a lot of time, and it's why Pastor Billy's putting a lot of effort into uh, gospel communities. Uh, the, the number one reason that people are not in gospel communities, it's the number one reason why you, uh, if you just blew it off and said, ah, it's not for me, the number one reason that people are not in gospel communities is because you don't like being around people that aren't like you. Maybe you're a golfer and you'd rather be, you know, on Wednesday nights at the uh, Brownsville Golf Center, or maybe you shoot skeet and you'd like to be at uh, La Paloma or wherever it is that they shoot skeet on Thursday. Or you, you know, you're from this social class, or you identify with this, these people, and you just like to be around people um, that are like you. It's the number one reason that people aren't in gospel communities. We think it's time, busyness. It's not. It's that. If you struggle with that, number one, hey, we, we understand. We all have a little bit of that in us. We can only like to be around people that are like us. So number one, we, we sympathize with you because we feel that way. And then the second thing I want to say is you're going to hate the sermon series that we're about to go into because it's like all for you. It's like all it, that, that little hang-up that we all have of not wanting to be around people like us or feeling like we're better than other people or feeling like we don't fit in. Like, like there's a paradigm in the, in, in, the, in the sermon series that we're going through over the next six or seven weeks that's just going to blow up your way of thinking. And I think that's good. Hey, good morning. Welcome to River Church. Uh, we, have, we have several families uh, who, out of an abundance of caution, our home today, and you can guess why, uh, but I, I, I'm here to tell you that you were, not, you were not exposed or impacted through any sort of river church activities. I've talked to these families, and I know where they've been and where they haven't been, but there are, like, some of these people that are, like, leading GCs are not even here today. Well, we got some people at home, again, out of a, an abundance of caution, healing up, or they've got a distant family member that's healing up, and we're just trying to do our best to... Uh, to be gracious toward one another. And so I double-checked and made sure that the, uh, the video camera is rolling and this sermon will be on, on our website. And so if you ever have to be out for, for, because of illness or for whatever reason, the sermons always go up um, on the next day. On, on Monday, they typically go up, and you can watch those. So those of you that are home that tell me you're watching, um, I hope you are. Um, I, feel, I feel for people that aren't here. I, I mean this sincerely. I thought about this, this this week. I feel for people that aren't here this week or today. I feel for, like, my wife who's teaching, um, in, uh, teaching the kids today and several other people teaching the kids today because this, we're going to lay some founda- a foundation, do some foundational work today um, that on which the rest of this sermon series is built. It's always that way, right? Week one, when you start a new sermon series. But in particular, uh, this is true this week, um, because we're going to do a deep dive into a book that you've probably never heard preached. If you have heard, if you've heard a sermon series preached out of the book of Philemon in your lifetime, don't tell me now, but come tell me later. I'm curious because... We just typically don't preach the book book of Philemon. If you like to geek out a little bit on scriptures, then this is going to be a sermon series for you. Um, If you don't like to drill way down deep in scripture and think about the original text, and think about that's okay. This is still going to be a good series for you. But it's going to be a somewhat unique sermon series. As I've said, we, uh, the church, at least in the United States, we... uh, typically don't study the book of Philemon. See if you can find it. By the way, I want us to set a little new, somewhat of a new course beginning with this series. It's kind of a double series because we're going to be studying Philemon 
And then the book of Colossians, I'll tell you why they're, they're paired together. But as we do this, I want to set a new course. I want those of you that maybe haven't been bringing your Bible, not throwing any stones, uh, or haven't been bringing, you know, your Bible on, on, you know, electronic version of your Bible, like nothing, you've just been relying on the screen, that's cool, but I want us to set a new course. I want you to bring something that you can look at, because again, we're going to be taking our time as we move through the book of Philemon. Philemon. One of the reasons that we're able to take our time as we move through the book of Philemon is if you'll turn there, it's only one chapter. They don't even call it a chapter. It is, it is only 25 verses. Of course, of course in the original, uh, the original letter, there were, no, there were no verse numbers. But, I mean, look, it didn't, even take, it didn't even take an entire page. Like, they had to leave this blank, wasted some paper there, because that's all, that's all the Apostle Paul had to, to write. It's a short book. Maybe that's one reason why preachers don't typically preach out of the, out of the book of Philemon. Uh, there, another reason, perhaps, is that it's, very, it's a very private letter. You're like, well, Randy, it made it into the Bible. Yeah, but it's a very private meaning that it is regarding a very personal matter. Philemon is one individual, and Paul is addressing a, a very, very personal, private matter in in Philemon's life, in his circle of influence. <clears throat> Another reason why it's somewhat hard to preach through is that it is, um, it is somewhat obscure in nature. What I mean by that is that, that we're not absolutely certain what Paul is asking Philemon to do. And that's on purpose. You'll see what I mean. I know that's super confusing right now, but but we, Paul is, is attempting to convince, persuade Philemon uh, to, to act a certain way in, in a relationship. But, but Paul leaves open the door for exactly how that's going to look. It might be like if I said, you should love your neighbor, and I mean your neighbor next door. But then I don't tell you, like, take them soup or... or buy them a gift. I, it's in Paul's writing to Philemon, there is some uncertainty. Exactly what is he asking him to do? So for those reasons, uh, perhaps uh, it, it doesn't get preached through very often, uh, but I'm excited about doing it. I, I, uh, I'll tell you this, um, I have spent the entire fall studying uh, the book of Philemon. You may or may not know this, but um, Pastor Billy, uh, he does graduate studies and does his own like growth personally, professionally, educationally in order to get up here and preach and be, and, and, and be a pastor. And, and I did seminary long ago, decades and decades ago, but I've actually gone, I'm doing graduate studies as well. And so I, I spent the entire, not lying here, this is true, spent the entire fall studying these 25 verses um, in Greek. And so I'm going to have to be careful. I'm going to super geek out on you this fall or this, this spring, but I'm not. I'm going to be careful, but I'm, I'm looking forward to preaching through this book uh, because there's just a lot of beautiful nuances in this book. I say book, letter, chapter, whatever you want to call it. Um, why are we preaching through Philemon and then Colossians back to back? Well, it's because there's good reason to believe that Paul, potentially from a, certainly from a prison cell, potentially from Rome, wrote these two letters, rolled them up, and then the same gentleman took, took these two scrolls, stuck them in his knapsack, and left Rome and headed to Colossae, with a letter to the Colossians and a letter to Philemon as an individual. Carried same, uh, same knapsack over the course of uh, many hundreds of miles. And so there's a similarity and there's a relationship uh, between these two books. And so 
We won't get to Colossians for a while, but that's where we're going to be spending this winter and spring in these two books. Now, like all good stories, again, we're laying foundation today, like all good stories, we have a context. You might call it uh, the, the back story. The current events going on in that day, that would be the general context. And then there's a very specific context, not just the general cultural events going on in that day, but, but the, the, the private, the personal backstory of the, you know, often the, the, the protagonist and the antagonist. Like what specifically is going on in those individual, individual lives? That's significant when we study this book because in the life of a Christian, which many of us are probably most of us in this room, we have placed our faith in Jesus and His work on the cross as being sufficient for the forgiveness of our sins. And, 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 and He has made a way for us to have a relationship with God the Father through His work on the cross. And now we are adopted children of God. Those of us who say we are people of faith, we, we, have, we have devoted our life to, to Jesus. Um, for, for us, uh, life is always unfolding in the context of, of culture and, and current events. And it's, it's, why, <clears throat> it's why life uh, for a Christian sometimes is, is way more difficult or at least complicated than the life of an unbeliever. Because the life of the unbeliever, he could just, he could just, she can just do whatever she wants. You know, it can be this way one day, and can be that way another day. You can react and respond and take advantage of. And, but, but the life of the Christian, the, the bar has been set by Jesus Christ. And now we're called to live lives of holiness. And so, so into this context, this, this, I, I, I love culture and I, I love our city, but I'll just say it this way. Into this wicked, wicked world, we are called to live holy lives. And so context and culture makes life Difficult. So Paul writes this letter out of a prison cell. Why is he in um, in in jail? Because he uh, because he would share his faith and he would plant churches, and 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 the government didn't like that. And 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 you think you know you think that it's hard being a Christian today, which I in that sense I don't think it is. But 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 in 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 Paul's day, because of his sharing of his faith, he's in jail. I hear people saying, you know, it's hard, it's hard being, uh, being a Christian um, in uh, you know, the United States in the 21st century. You know, we have lived through 200 plus years of unprecedented religious freedom. The, the freedom to come here makes us lazy as Christians, in fact. We have the freedom to come here and worship as we please and, and go out and proselytize and tell people about, about share our faith. Um, and I don't see any reason as to why that is going to come to an end. But in Paul's day, Paul's day, it was different. So he writes from the prison cell and he writes to Philemon and he speaks of the context. Here's the context of the book. Very, very quick flyover. The context of the book is uh, a culture of slavery. A very high percentage, I'll give you numbers in weeks to come, but a very high percentage of people in the Roman world in that day were actually enslaved in some way. Now, you can't think slave, uh, you, can't, you can't think uh, antebellum era, uh, you know, American slavery. It's, it's different than that, and we'll get into that. But, but a high percentage of people were enslaved. And so part of the context of Paul's writing to Philemon is this backdrop of the, the ill, the, the, the evil of, of slavery. And, and, and on top of that would have been what, would call, what, we, what we would call a caste system, a, a class system. Also, we had oppression, we had abuse, um, and all types of, of brokenness that humanity is, is capable of. 
So our role as, uh, as Christians and our responsibility as Christians in hard times has always been the ministry of reconciliation. But if you're a divider, you don't bring people together, but you're divisive in nature. If you're not a reconciler, then you go against the grain of all that Jesus taught because Jesus has given us Paul tells us this. Jesus has given us, Christ followers, the ministry of reconciliation, of bringing people together, not separating people or pulling them apart, but bringing them together, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, modern-day India, think about this. Think about being a Christian in modern-day India. You, you, you probably know something about this, but in modern-day India, they still, they still have some semblance of a caste system, a class system. So if you were born a one or a two, uh, there's no way in the world you, you, you wouldn't be even, even be allowed to. It would be, it'd be dishonorable to allow your children to marry a, a three or a four or a five. Now, if you're born into that, and the caste system in India isn't what it was, but it's still there. It still, to some degree, dominates their lives. Now, think about this. If you're a Christian in India... Dare you go to a church as a one or a two where fours and fives congregate? Or should we just have a church for you, the upper echelon of the caste system, and let the fours and fives uh, have their own church? And you might say, well, you know, Randy, we don't have a caste system in the United States, and we don't, but I think you get the implications. It goes back to what I said about wanting to be or not wanting to be in a gospel community based on, you know, how the cool factor, like how cool you are, comparison to how cool other people are, and you've got to find the right mix. And so, so our role and responsibility as Christians in hard times has always been the ministry of reconciliation. So Paul's letter <clears throat> written to Philemon in its, in its brevity, it's a very short book, in its, in its simplicity, he does not go into deep, uh, the, 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 the development of deep theological concepts. Paul's letter to Philemon, nonetheless, is an engaging, an engaging guide uh, for the Christian on how to Integrate, that means how to merge or combine my faith and my interpersonal relationships, how I relate to you and how you relate to me and how we get along as a church. One, one, one theologian, N.T. Wright, he says this of the book of Philemon, and this is a big statement because it's such a brief book. He says, no part of the New Testament more clearly demonstrates integrated Christian thinking and living. Some of us, maybe we excel at Christian thinking, but we stink relationally. And maybe some of us, you know, like we're really relational people, but our, but our theology, our thoughts on God are just totally jacked up. And N.T. Wright is saying that the, the book of Philemon brings those two good thinking and righteous living together, perhaps like no other book in the New Testament. <clears throat> Paul was, in total, throughout his life and in all of his teachings, the Apostle Paul was committed to the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people together. I'll give you another quote by Ernest Martin. He said this, Along with being an example of efforts to influence behavior, Philemon, as, as a letter of the book, it opens windows into the character of Paul. This brief letter greatly enhances our knowledge of the Christ-like person Paul was. I've, had an, I, I've read a number of of uh, theologians who say, you want to know the heart of Paul? Read the book of Philemon. 
which is just a letter, which is just 25 verses. How odd that he wrote, he wrote volumes. He wrote many, many books. And yet a number of theologians say, go to the book of Philemon if you want to know the heart of Paul. So, how does this, this message or this, this ministry of reconciliation, which God has given each one of us, we are to be reconcilers, how does that play out in the life of the, in your life, in, in, in my life? And so for that, for that, we have the book of Philemon. Let me tell you a little bit more about it, and then we're going to read it. Philemon, you got his name now because I've said it about 20 times, but who is Philemon? Philemon is the addressee. He's the recipient of this letter. You, you, probably, you probably figured that out. He is apparently a man of wealth, a man of privilege, a man of influence. It's, I'll get to this more in coming weeks, but he, he probably came to faith. He is a Christian. He probably came to faith under the teachings of the Apostle Paul. So that's Philemon. And we've got another character who we're not even, whose name we're not even going to read today, but you need to know about this character, Onesimus. Onesimus is the other uh, main character that, who is addressed in this book. Onesimus was a slave. And Onesimus was a slave to Philemon, his master. His master, Philemon, is a Christian. Onesimus had apparently, and this is the part where this, this letter is not complete, it didn't give us all the facts completely, but, but apparently Onesimus had run away from Colossae, run away from his, his Christian master Philemon, and he had run, most likely Paul is in Rome, he had run all the way to Rome, somehow providentially or re- relationally he he came in contact with Paul in prison. Paul leads Onesimus to faith in Jesus Christ. And now, now Paul is sending Onesimus back to, uh, to Colossae, back to Philemon. And we're not going to get there for a few weeks, but it's important that you understand that part. I would encourage you to go home and read the entire letter before, before, we, before I preach on this again next week. Um, so keep that in mind as we unpack the letter. And what Paul is doing, I'm not going to give you the details yet, but what Paul is doing in this letter, uh, he's asking Philemon to, to receive Onesimus back, but more than that, he's asking Philemon to relearn or rethink how he relates to someone in a, diff- in a, in a, in a different class, a different social order. And that's where Christianity, within the context of the evil world that we live in, um, the, the, the ethics, the teachings of Christianity make the life of the Christian sometimes messy, d- d- difficult. In other words, we as readers of Philemon 2 are invited to learn a new ethic. In light of the gospel message, what Jesus did on the cross, we are now to live a new way in contrast to the world's system. Now, you need to know that in, in case you're, you're, you're waiting for us to get to this part where, where uh, Paul just outright blasts uh, slavery, he never quite gets there. That's not quite the point. It, it, at least not overtly. Um, pr- that it doesn't mean that Philemon is to, is, is to primarily fight against the world's class system in that day in the Roman world. Christianity was too small. Christianity was too insignificant to blow up a whole class system, to, to blow up a, a, a whole order known as slavery, um, that, that wasn't the point. Paul's point, uh, he doesn't take on the system of, of slavery, but rather he takes on the, the issue of the heart in the life of the Christian. He's unpacking this new gospel ethic, which calls Christian masters 
and Christian slaves to, to call one another, to look one another in the eye and say, you're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. Now, per, perhaps, perhaps Paul in his writing is, is being a little more crafty than we might originally think because if Paul is leading Christian brothers and sisters within the church, some at a higher social order than, than others, some masters, some slaves, if he's calling them to look one another in the face and say, you're my brother, you're my sister, in light of that, is it not ultimately untenable, impossible to think that, that slavery would have continued to impact the relationships in the church? We don't have slavery. Uh, we don't have a, an outright caste system. But there are things, there are unique aspects of who we are as believers in the church even in River Church, that separate us. And Paul's main goal is to bring us together. All right, with all of that as a backdrop, let's read. We're only going to read three verses today. We've got to take our time. It's only, we only got 25 verses, so we're going to take our time. Uh, no, there's more reason to, to slow down than just the brevity of the book. There's just a lot here. This is all we're going to read today. Philemon, verse, or chap, uh, it says one, one through three, but really there are only three verses, only one chapter. Here's how it goes. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can go to the cell right before that, what we've got here today is, all right, uh, never mind, it's several, it's several, it's several forms. We'll just go back to the scripture passage. What we have today is an opening letter, the, uh, the opening address, rather, of the letter. It's something that you and I often overlook. We write, you know, maybe it's as impersonal as to whom it may concern, you know, or maybe it's more personal to my favorite aunt, Ginger, and, you know, her, her husband, Ralph, or whatever, right? That's what we have today, but there's, there's some significance here. So I want us to look at what, what is Paul saying here in today's opening address? Well, he starts with, I, Paul, and he refers to himself as a prisoner of Christ, prisoner of Jesus. Now, in all of Paul's letters, Romans and First and Second Corinthians, all the way to this final letter in order, Philemon, in all of his letters, he, he almost always, ref, uh, in his address, calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm an apostle of like the 13th apostle, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. But the tone, the nature, the tenor of this letter is different, such that he doesn't start with that. It's one of, I think, two or three letters that doesn't start with, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ. It'd be like if I spent my whole life writing letters, I, um, Randy, pastor at River Church, greet you, Philemon, but, but then there's one letter that I write, and I don't, I don't put that, the pastor of, of River Church. I put, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lowly person. I'm a, I'm a prisoner. I'm a, in this case, he says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. The, the, the implicit goal of this whole book, and especially these three verses that we're writing today, reading today, is the, the reconfiguration of relationships Paul's not here going to say, look, you need to listen to me. I'm an apostle. He comes in kind of under the radar today in a very humble way. I'm, I'm a prisoner of Christ. <clears throat> and then he says, Timothy, I, Paul, prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother. 
Suffice it to say, Timothy wasn't co-writing this letter. Most likely what he's saying, he's saying, Timothy, Timothy's here with me. He's my right-hand man. I can count on Timothy. So as I'm writing this letter, just know that Timothy is here with me. He's my partner in ministry. He is here with me doing the work of ministry right alongside me. He loved Timothy. We know that. And then he goes on and he addresses Philemon. And he says, Philemon, our <clears throat> beloved fellow worker. Now, Paul in a few verses is going to get to the point where he's going to ask Philemon to do something that's really difficult, really challenging. But he didn't start with that. There's, there's also some lessons here in, in, in persuasion. How, you know what? You, 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 you want to you convince somebody that, that whatever it is you're asking to do is the right thing to do. Don't go in with both guns blazing. He goes in carefully. He goes in gently. He says, Philemon, you're, you're my beloved fellow worker. What is he saying that in, the, in that? What's he talking about, fellow worker? Do they have some business together? No, he's talking about church planting. He's saying, Philemon, I love you. You're a, you're a church planter. In fact, we haven't got there yet, but a, a church meets in your home. Philemon, you're, you're, you, you, you look good in my eyes. I, I, think, I think highly of you. I love you. He's saying we, we're both, Philemon, we're both working for the same goal here. Seeing the gospel go out. Seeing churches planted. We're, we're on the same team, brother. I'm not coming at you because we're, we're, we're enemies. We are friends. We're on the same team. And then he, he addresses Aphia. Um, we could take a long time studying these other two characters, but I'll just tell you what I've, what I've come to believe from, from reading and, and, and doing some study a lot of study, and that is that Aphia is maybe, I'll even say probably, Philemon's wife. So it says, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our, um, our fellow soldier, Aphia, probably Philemon's wife, perhaps a central uh, figure in the uh, in 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 the same church, the planting of this church, it it, it reminds me of when Paul talks about uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, mentioned elsewhere in his writings that they're this team, and it seems here that probably he's saying Philemon and Aphia, partners in ministry, Archippus, maybe maybe their son, but certainly. Uh, Certainly a, a person that he respected, a fellow soldier. Uh, we're not going to read it today, but Ar Archippus, who maybe is their son, he's addressed in the other book that we're going to be studying, Colossians. So you have these, the father, <clears throat> perhaps the wife, perhaps the, uh, the son. As I said, it seems quite probable that uh, Philemon had come, uh, come to faith under Paul's teaching, and now a uh, church is meeting his home. And it's not only it's his home, but it's the home that he shares with Aphia. It's the home that perhaps he shares with his son, Archippus. And any pastor's child can tell you that when dad is in ministry, it's like the whole house is in ministry. So Paul writes this letter, and he addresses Philemon, and he addresses the, uh, the other family members with respect, with reverence, and he says, I, I know there's a church meeting in your home. What's all this about? Why are we spending so much time on these three verses that seem rather perfunctory or, 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 or <clears throat> just, just uh, you know, just the opening, the opening statements? Why are we hanging on these, this address here? Well, there's a significance to this. I've got another quote. It says, One of the enduring and extremely relevant teachings of Philemon is the degree to which Christians are bound to one another in all their activities through their common faith. We, don't, we, don't, we have a hard time living that way. We have a, a little bit of a connection here at River Church. And this isn't just about River Church. It's about the church in general. We've got some relationship here, but then we've also got... The, 
all these layer upon layer of other significant relationships, which quite frankly often trump your relationships here at the church. In other words, sometimes those relationships, whatever they are, are more important, more significant. The, a club or an organization or whatever maybe trumps, meaning it's more important than your relationships here. And in, 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 in this teaching that we're going to be going through, as it says, one of the relevant, significant, enduring teachings is, is just how, how much we as Christians are bound to one another, ought to be bound to one another. Okay. So, <clears throat> as I've already said, Philemon is usually regarded as a resident of Colossae. Onesimus is the slave, and his master Philemon is a Christian, and Onesimus is now a Christian. And honestly, this sounds like a very private matter to me. Every one of us in this room, you have, you have a private matter. Sometimes you bring them to me. Like maybe you've got a beef with, you know, a, a co-worker. And you, you, you bring it to me and we talk about it. And we share it. Now how would you feel if, if, if the next Sunday I got up here and I said, all right, today I'm preaching on Bill's beef with his employer. Bill, stand up so everybody knows who, beef is, who Bill is, right? Okay, sit down, Bill. We're going to talk about this, right? You might even leave the church, even if you're not Bill, right? You'd be offended, you'd be offended for Bill. It's a private letter regarding a private matter, and yet, and yet Paul addresses a whole slew of people, including the entire church. What we can take from this address at the beginning is that, that this was meant to be read not only by Philemon, but by the church that meets in his house. Why does Paul do that? Why does he include the whole church? Well, it's lost on us in 21st century Christianity. The point here is that it reflects the, the corporate nature of early Christianity in which there was no private um, matter that didn't inevitably become a public matter. It affected everybody because we're all brothers, we're all sisters in this new family of God. So then, to close out this, and I'm going to give you a couple of big ideas that, that I, we can extrapolate from this, and we're, we're done for the day. This is all introduction. Um, Paul closes out the opening, ad, uh, the opening address today with saying, Grace and peace to you from our Father, uh, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly Old Testament Jews of that day would have been comfortable and familiar, at least with him speaking the, 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 the grace of, of, of God the Father, this universal well-being or, or shalom that Paul speaks, and yet the central tenet here is he is now tying that to Jesus Christ. He's saying, I offer you, um, I welcome you, uh, this grace, this peace from God the Father, he says, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that short statement, closing out this opening address, Paul draws a direct line of relationship between the central gospel truth, grace, peace, the shalom of God, and how they're now delivered to us, made available to us through Christ's work on the cross. Grace, peace, shalom, relational um, reconciliation, Paul says, it's all now available because of what Christ Jesus did did on the cross. Three big ideas out of this, and we are done. Big idea number one is this. Christ's work on the cross brings a paradigm shift relationally. Your relationships can't be the way they formerly were before you became a Christ follower. Or if you would say, I've been a Christ follower since I was eight years old, then what I would say is, your relationships can't look like the rest of the world's pagan relationships. How you treat, how you mistreat, 
how you relate to people. It can't be. It changes now. It's different. There's a paradigm shift. You can't treat people in the grocery store like just some average Joe can. You can't treat people in the marketplace the way you, there's a paradigm shift. I'm sorry, but that is that is part of following Jesus is how you relate, how you treat to people. It it, it changes. We see one another in a totally new light, especially in the church. I mean, I was talking about the marketplace, but especially in the church. We see one another. I see you in a new light as a co-equal brother, as a co-equal sister. This was a real front in that day, um, a real threat to the system of abuse and slavery and the haves and the have-nots. It was it was it was a uh, it, it, it was a front to that that system of that day. But it also it also uh, creates some conflict among us because even in this room, even in the city that we live in, it's not a class system. It's not a caste system. But they're the haves and, and the have-nots, and they're the educated and they're the uneducated, and and there are people of all different walks of life, and there are people of all different skin colors, and how we relate to one another now has to be filtered through this, this, this tenet, this New Testament teaching which says that we are co-equal brothers and sisters in Christ. Big idea number two, and you're going to see this through all 25 verses that we study over the next six weeks. Big idea number two, Christ's work on the cross makes formerly private matters now shared matters in the church. I really hate this. I was driving to work today, and I was saying, this is probably... This is probably um, the, the most challenging big idea of the three in my life because I tend to be a very private person. Odd, I get up here and like spill my guts every week, right? But, but, but nonetheless, I tend to be a very private person, um, at least with my, my, my feelings and my emotions, and, and yet, one of the undeniable big ideas from, from the book of Philemon is that Christ's work on the cross means for the church things that we want to keep to ourselves, that we want to, you know, I don't want to tell you or share with you because you might use it against me. Those things now become public. We are to share and relate, and hold accountable. <clears throat> yes, this is a private letter addressing a private matter, but Paul writes he just, he just opens up the whole can for the entire church. Christ's work on the cross means that the Christian now lives a life of community, in community, open to his, her, brothers and sisters. Third big idea is this. This is the one that, that's going to really, the, the, the test is the test of time in this one. Because this is a long-term commitment. And that, that is Christ's work on the cross brings lifelong, a lifelong reordering of our values and our relationships in the church. So this is one that would say, like, don't be quick, too quick to jump on board and be like, yeah, I want that. I'm committed to that. Because this is a lifelong sort of commitment. It's a costly undertaking. You need to be able to... to to, be, to humble yourself um, before people long term. And, and it, it, sometimes it costs you money. And I, I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Sometimes it costs you time. And in, if this makes you uncomfortable, it, it should make you uncomfortable. It costs you time and, and money, and you have to give up some of your pride because we must, three, we must rethink how we treat people that are in a, a different social order than we are. I must rethink like how I make good deals in the marketplace because of the system, what the system affords me, and, and, and how I might take advantage of cheap labor just because I can. And when you have to look across the aisle at someone and you, you know that you could take advantage of them uh, financially just because of your social order, but then you realize that's a brother in Christ. Uh, he's a Christian. I'm a Christian, she's a Christian, I'm a Christian. How we relate to one another gets really difficult in light of this paradigm, in, in light of this ethic. 
in light of the fact that in Christ we are all now brothers and sisters I mean, is it possible for a class system in which we ourselves, uh, some on one side, some on the other, continue to exist within the church? Or does, does Jesus just blow that up? So that's what we're talking about over the next six weeks. Um, I find it really fascinating. I find it really um, relevant, and I hope you do too. Let's, let's review those three big ideas one more time and we'll pray. First big idea is this. Christ's work on the cross brings a paradigm shift relationally. Number two, Christ's work on the cross makes formerly private matters now shared matters. And big idea number three, Christ's work on the cross brings a lifelong reordering of our values. In other words, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a lifelong work in progress. Let's pray. Got to pray that this, in real practical ways, this sermon series over the next six or seven weeks would be a blessing to us as a church, that we would, we would, uh, more than ever, we would make friends with people that maybe weren't friends with formerly. I thank you for how you have done that already at River Church, how you've brought us together in ways that um, are unique and Christ-like. I pray that you would do that more and more. I pray that we would continue to be able to say as a church, you know, we would never be friends except for Christ's work on the cross. We probably would never have met, even though we live in the same city, except that we, we come together because of our love for Jesus and Jesus' love for us. May that be. We pray this in Christ's strong name. Amen.